Jesus says, I am coming soon. Welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday of Advent. It is wonderful to have you here. Um, it's wonderful to see those uh, faces of, of people who return for, uh, for Christmas, even though they're, they're away for much of the winter. Um, and it's wonderful to see the faces of family and friends visiting as well. So we are glad you're with us. Have a couple of uh, things to draw your attention to in the announcements. One is a reminder that a group of us will be going to the Calvin Worship Symposium at the end of January, and we would love to have you come with us. Um, it is something that we have uh, support from the, con from the uh, congregation for. Um, so if finances are tight, that's okay. You can still come. And if you're interested in doing so, please let me know. Um, also, a huge thank you to everyone involved with the wish list. Uh, it went extremely well this year. We had many families come in to uh, receive uh, gift cards and to, to choose toys and wrap them for their children, and it was uh, a wonderful event. So thank you very much for um, your participation in that. Also, a quick program note. I don't know, do you ever get... Uh, you know, towards about this time of year and realize, oh, I forgot to get that gift or we were supposed to do that. Or, um, that happens in church too. And so you don't see it here, but right after the passing of the piece is special music um, that the uh, brass will be playing. Um, so please don't be surprised. And with that, let us focus our hearts and our minds on the worship of our God as we listen to this morning's prelude. <clears throat> At this point, I would like to invite the Coleman family to come forward for our Advent wreath lighting. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who have lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. I will lead the blind by a road they do not know. By the paths they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn, to the, uh, turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I will do, and I will not forsake them. The Lord says to his servant, it is to light a thing that you should be my servant to, ri- to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to restore the survivors of Israel, I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Come Lord Jesus, our light and our salvation. Right, our opening hymn number 49, David's. You may be seated. Now please hear the opening prayer. God of grace, your eternal word took flesh among us when Mary and Joseph placed their lives at the surface, uh, service of your will. Prepare our hearts for his coming again. Keep us steadfast in hope and faithful in service 
that we may receive the coming of his kingdom for the sake of Jesus Christ, the ruler of all, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. when uh, about you but we uh, we tend to clean house when we people come over uh, and often am, am grateful when we have visitors because it forces us to clean house maybe a little better than we would we have this opportunity every Sunday to clean to welcome Jesus. Yeah. That's what confession is all about. So let us take time to confess for God one another. together. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Sisters and brothers, hear the good news, the good news that is for us, the Israel of God through Jesus Christ. Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Know that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. As God has forgiven us in Christ, let us also forgive one another. 
The peace of Christ be with you all. So now let us hear the prayer of illumination. Holy God, our hope and strength by the power of your spirit, prepare the way in our hearts for the coming of your word so that we may see the glorious signs of your promise fulfilled through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Isaiah, which it has been all month, and we are... Uh, Book 7, and verses 10 through 16, and if you would like to follow along in your uh, pew Bible, it's on page 558. This, old this morning's Old Testament reading is from the prophet Isaiah, and the prophecy is delivered to Ahaz, who had abandoned God as he sought powerful allies in his wars against Arab and Israel. The prophecy was partially fulfilled in the uh, near term in Hezekiah, but was not fully fulfilled until the coming of Jesus. A reading from Isaiah. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to test. Then Isaiah said, hear now you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. 
The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The word of God for the people of God. Now our epistle reading is from Romans, book one, verses one through seven. And you can uh, follow along if you would like to on page 911, 9-11. In the opening of Paul's letter to Romans, he emphasizes that Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy and the means by which God of Israel became known to the non-Jewish world. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who, who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And as you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, and to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God for the people of God. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel according to Matthew. We're reading from the first chapter and reading verses 18 through 25. It could be found on page 783 of your Pew Bible or on page 1 of your New Testament. I invite you to uh, read or listen along as we hear God's word for us this morning. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Would you please pray with me? Holy God, in your mercy, send your spirit upon us that what we hear might be from you and that anything I speak which is not of you might be discarded so that we may grow more fully into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So if you have a, a crash, a, a manger scene at home, you know all the little figures in there, right? I mean, of course, there's, there's Jesus, the center of it all, and Mary, his mother, 
There's those, those shepherds, these humble, humble men who were brought in to, uh, to witness the birth of the king, to be there right up front. The magi who we put in our manger scene, even though they didn't arrive until later, but the, the magi bringing their gifts and their wisdom from the east. And then there's Joseph. Joseph who, you know, he's supposed to be there, but we're not really quite sure what to do with him. Joseph who tends to get forgotten. Joseph who, if you're trying to sell your house, you bury his figurine underground, you know, upside down in your yard thinking that that might affect whether it sells. Confession, who's done that before? Right? Uh, I bet there's a few in here who have. Uh, Joseph tends to be kind of overlooked. And yet he is a part of this Christmas story. He's someone for whom I just have great respect, great admiration. I mean, here's, here's Joseph just living his life in this small town, doing his work, excited because he's going to get married. He's betrothed to this young woman. And betrothal then was, it was a lot more than just a ring on a finger. It was a serious commitment. It was a, uh, not quite being married, but a pre-marriage that was just much more significant socially and spiritually than engagement tends to be in our culture. Here's this young woman who he may or may not have met before, but everything was arranged. And then he finds out that she's pregnant. Right? Can you imagine how that felt? This woman you're supposed to marry is pregnant. And he knows it's not his. He doesn't know whose it is, but he knows it's not his child that she is carrying. He had to be devastated. I expect he was probably a little angry. But being a good man, he decides not to shame her in public. He had every right to. He could have dragged her into the streets and said, look at this harlot. Look at what she did. She's pregnant and she's supposed to be my wife. But not Joseph. No, he decides, you know, obviously he can't marry her, but he's not gonna, he's not gonna shame her. He's gonna divorce her quietly. Just keep things, you know, on the down low, as it were. And then he goes to bed and he has a dream. And in his dream, an angel of the Lord appears to him and says, hey, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the child that is in her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And you're supposed to name him Jesus. And he wakes up. Now, if I were Joseph, and I woke up from a dream like that, in a situation like that, I would probably be thinking, you know, I shouldn't have had that spicy food for dinner last night. <laughs> or I might have been thinking that this is really weighing heavy on me and, and making me anxious and giving me weird dreams. But Joseph accepts it for what it is, a word from God. And he believes this dream that told him, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Now, I can think of a lot of reasons for Joseph to be afraid to take Mary as his wife. He had every right to have this woman who became pregnant out of wedlock, who was betrothed to him. He had every right to shame her 
in public to let everybody know the terrible thing that she had done. But if he marries her, the shame that should have gone to her will go to him. People are going to talk. Yeah. People can do math. They can count months. Yeah. They'll know that that child was not conceived after they were married. Some of his friends might wink and nod a little bit. But most people in the community would look down on him. This man who didn't have enough self-control to wait until marriage. And this child who then would be a shameful child. Something to be afraid of. The shame that would come with following through on this marriage. And he might also have been afraid that, well, maybe, maybe it was just a dream. Maybe it was something I ate or just my anxious mind working. What, what if I'm wrong? Okay. What if I believe this dream and it's not true and I commit my whole life to being with this unfaithful woman? A scary prospect to, to commit your life to something you can't prove. That fear of shame and that fear of, of doubt. But even more so, it's that realization that he had something to be afraid of because he had to act on it. It's not just an idea that he could say, well... You know, God said this child's from the Holy Spirit. That's kind of a cool thing. I haven't seen that before. Yeah. And he could sit around and, and ponder it. No, he had to act. He had to get up out of bed and go and do what the angel said. Marry this woman. Joseph... Is, a, is this wonderful model of, of faithfulness and courage, humility and kindness, stepping out and going in the midst of, of so much pushing against his acting. But because he did so, he got to be the stepdad of God. Because he was, was faithful, because he believed what God told him, because he acted on it, Jesus was a part of his life growing up. You know, we, we hear about and think a lot about how Mary's relationship with Jesus was, was special those of you who may have been raised Catholic or have Catholic friends, that's a big emphasis. But I wonder about how, how Jesus feels towards Joseph. This man who didn't have to be there. This man who chose to be his stepdad, to raise him, to teach him a trade, to encourage and uplift him. It's a pretty amazing thing. And in the season of Advent, we have an opportunity to be like Joseph. You know, Advent, Advent means coming. It's a season when we prepare for the coming of Christ. We, we prepare to celebrate his first coming in Nazareth, in that, or in Bethlehem, excuse me, in that little, uh, in that manger. We prepare to celebrate his second coming, to look forward to that. That time when Jesus will return and he will put things right. He will complete the work he began in his time on earth. But Advent is also a time to prepare for his coming here and now in us. For us to accept him in our lives fully and richly, 
to think about that, that image from the book of Revelation that says, when Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. And he's not speaking to people who don't know him. He's speaking to believers. He's speaking to us. He stands at the door and, and knocks, and we have the opportunity to not be afraid to let him in. Because like Joseph, we may feel that if we, you know, if we profess belief in this one, well, people are going to think we're kind of nuts. A human being born of a virgin, living this, this life, and then, and then dying on a cross, being buried, and, and three days later, rising again, and ascending into heaven, think people are going to look at us funny. It can be a little shameful perhaps we can be afraid to let Christ in because of that we can be afraid to let Christ in because well what if we're wrong it seems an awfully big commitment for something we can't prove doesn't it And we might fail to let Christ in because Christ sends us out. Because his command to us is go. Go and make disciples of all nations. Okay. Go and, and proclaim the, the kingdom of God in what you do and what you say. Okay. Go and be my ambassadors in the world. Not just sit around and think, well, yeah, I believe that. It's an interesting intellectual proposition and I buy into it. It's got to be more than that. Theologian Kevin Van Hooser, I've been reading uh, some of his work recently, and, and he talks about us Christians gathering together like this as a church, in the meaning of that. And he says, we must no longer think of the church merely as an antechamber to heaven, a place to wait around. Rather, the church, the company of those in union with Christ, is the anticipation of heaven, a place to begin practicing it, because Christ is among us. Sunday morning, every Sunday morning, not just in Advent, Every Sunday morning, we gather to, to practice heaven. We gather to be trained for heaven. We gather to be encouraged and empowered to bring heaven out into the world. You know, football players, where's Lois? There she is. You know, professional football players, they practice six days a week so that they can perform on Sunday. Okay. We practice Sundays so that we can be in the game the other six days of the week. We can't just acknowledge it and say we accept it. We have to go. And thank God we have great examples of what that looks like. Examples in scripture and examples in life. Examples like Joseph, who was willing to get over his fear to go and take Mary as his wife and to welcome the Christ child. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. When we gather as church, we gather uh, to be prepared to go. Yeah. But we do it knowing what it is that we believe. And so as we uh, gather this Sunday and prepare to receive communion together, let us profess the faith of the church as uh, worded in the Nicene Creed, this creed that is accepted throughout the world and in so many places and so many languages. Let us profess our faith together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now as we continue to respond to God's word in the receiving of our offering, let us do so um, with joy and gratitude for this season, for uh, the one whose birth we celebrate.
Gracious God, we come before you today with hearts full of gratitude and thanksgiving for this offering in this church. Lord, in this holy Christmas season, may we draw nearer to you. Thank you for showing us that Christmas begins in the heart. And for the love that it teaches, help us now to keep the light of Christmas message burning brightly all year. Let us go forth then in your son's name. Amen. You may be seated. Sisters and brothers, Isaiah tells us that people will gather from east and west and from north and south to sit at table with the people of God. This table is Jesus' table, the Lord's table, to which he invites all those who trust in him. Whether you are visiting, whether you are of a denomina different denomination, no matter your age, um, you're invited to this table. <clears throat> to come and receive Christ, to be strengthened and nourished and encouraged. So please join me in prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift your hands to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. How can we thank you, O God, for sun and moon and stars, for breath and life and all things good, for your steadfast promise and your faithful love, for the day that is surely coming when all things will be made new. With saints, with angels, and with the whole creation, we join the ancient and eternal hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord in the highest. We give you thanks, holy God, for Jesus, who came to be your living word, to baptize us with spirit and fire, to feed the hungry, to humble the mighty, and to announce the good news of your coming realm. With thanksgiving, we remember how, when the hour had come, Jesus took his place at the table with the apostles, he said to them, I will not eat this Passover again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. We give you thanks that as he sat at table on that night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so with thanks and praise, we offer ourselves to you, sharing this holy meal, O God, remembering Christ dying and rising, and praying, come, Lord Jesus. For great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, upon this bread, this cup, these people, Christ's body and blood, given in love for the world. Make us one in the Spirit, one in the Church, and one with Christ our Lord. Make us gentle, joyful, thankful people, serving our neighbors, worshiping you alone. Keep us in the peace of Christ until you gather us at your table in glory. Even now, a voice is crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we will be serving by intention. We'll invite you when the uh, ushers uh, come forward to your row to come forward uh, past the font. You may dip your fingers in the water, touch it to your forehead if you like as a remembrance of your baptism. And then as you come to the front, you will receive a piece of bread with the words, this is the body of Christ, and you may, may respond with thanks be to God. And then dip that bread into the cup and receive both elements together. At the cup, you'll hear those words, this is the blood of Christ, and you may receive with amen. Uh, if you are gluten-free, we do have gluten-free wafers available, um, as well as a cup set aside for that. Yeah. And if you are unable to come forward, please let the usher know so that we may bring communion to you. All is prepared. Come to the table.
Would you please join me in our unison prayer after communion? Mighty God, holy is your name. We thank you for gathering us at your table and feeding us with the bread of life. As we leave this table to go to the many places where you call us, send your spirit to accompany us so that we may share in your magnificent work, lifting up those who are laid low showing mercy to all in need of human kindness, and feeding the bodies and hearts of all who are hungry. Amen. And as we prepare to send this meal out to those of our church family who are unable to be here, let us ex uh, extend the table with these words. We send you out with this bread and cup to share the feast to the, of the risen Lord. And now let us rise again in body or in spirit as we sing our closing hymn, People Look East.
As we faithfully live our lives in the coming week, what does God call us to do? And brothers and sisters, as we leave this place today, go. Go into the world knowing that you have been called by Christ to carry his light into the dark world around us. And go with his blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit rest on and abide in us today and every day. Hallelujah and amen.